yardstick to measure Auckland building costs as provided by the 1956 Parade of Homes, Boyce Avenue, Mount Roskill. With only days to go before opening, 38 firms race to put in all the many thousand blows of spade and hammer, saw and trowel that it takes to make a small street of 58 modest houses. A few of the houses were architect designed. Among the novelties was this home with all utilities needing plumbing grouped in a central block. It sells for £2,400, not including section or furniture which was moved in for display. The home the Minister of Housing, Mr Sullivan, has just visited was built for £2,850. Home seekers hear the leader of the opposition, Mr Nash, say how the country's working together in a big housing drive. Mr Sullivan proves the results of group building schemes with facts and figures and 30,000 people tour the exhibits during the weekend to see how they like the houses. This one is pre-cut, assembled on the spot. This one is built from six-foot prefabricated panels. Being first example of a new design, the price had not been settled, but it's planned for comfortable and airy living. In Boyce Avenue, there may be nothing startlingly new about the houses, but there's good economic sense in building houses a street at a time, and in one builder specialising in certain designs and materials. Any idea to reduce building costs is certain to draw the crowds. Forty years on the road, yet the 300 miles from Nelson to Christchurch is no trouble to this 1916 section. Of course, they knew how to make cars in my day, and it's good to see the youngsters keeping the past alive by polishing them up for the veteran car rally. Now, this one takes a man back a few years. 1906. A fine car that did be on. And there were quite a few of them at the rally. None of your modern self-starting systems to break down on this Cadillac. 1905 she came out. Maybe she's getting on in years, but she's young enough yet to cut a caper. Good, honest brass. None of your flaky chromium plating. Now that's the way to keep them running. Give them plenty of care and they'll literally last your lifetime. This Dennis fire engine went to blazes in 1916. It was driven up from Dunedin. Ah, there she is, me old flame Josephine. She's a unique light van, imported from France in 1908 by a Christchurch drapery firm. A 1904 Derrick, the same model as Genevieve. Another to Dion, 1908, a year before Blerio flew the channel. There's Dennis the Menace again. The oldest car on parade, a Dion of 1898. It was on the road in the old Queen's Day. That was quite a while ago. And the young Crocs watched the old Crocs. Everybody was interested. And those on the way and the 4,000 at the rally itself. It was held in Dean's Bush at Rickerton, and a great day it was too. And looking at some of the models made me wish I was young again. And when the time came to put the cars through their paces, most of them showed they were as good as new. Reliable, simple and sturdy, and with a lot less fancy gadgets to go wrong. Cars had to be good in those days. The roads weren't. And they had to be manoeuvrable too. There were some tricky places to get in and out. But that's what these trials are for. Garaging tests, or what they call touch and go tests. Of course the cars can manage them all right, but the drivers have to be pretty skillful. And the Saxon has a go. Oh, Sonny, you should have braked earlier. The day after the rally, the antiques drove off to a picnic. All that was required to make it seem like the old days were the coats and caps and goggles, and of course the picture hats and veils for the ladies. One lass did carry a parasol, and very nice it looked too. So did the girl, of course. A car, a picnic basket, and a pretty girl. Now, what more could a young fella want? Now, come to think of it, an old fella might be happy with that lot, too. One or two of the buses needed minor repairs, but nothing serious. In fact, there was nothing to mar the whole day. Fine weather, fine cars, and fine... Oh, that's enough said. Fourth in 
the chain of 10 hydroelectric stations planned for the Waikato, Whakamaru is ready for work. Its penstocks await the surge of water which will bring life to its generators. Its network of power lines is complete, yet an air of uneasiness hangs about the great dam. Months of drought have had that effect. Despite leaden skies, is there enough water on hand? Enough water to do the job without starving the other dams downstream. A spate of water 60 miles distant and the answer is on its way. The gates are open at Taupo, where the flow into the Waikato is under rigid control. Foaming through the Hooker Gorge, the released waters race for the valley. Atiamuri still building, the torrent roars. Atiamuri, which will be the fifth dam in the Waikato chain. The forward movement has stopped. The waters are hushed. The level rises with its escape route dammed. But not until the water tops the spillway will the situation be safe. These are the anxious hours. A last minute job and it's got to be done now or never. The bed of the tail race will be exposed for not more than a few hours. It's the only chance they'll ever get to blast away final obstructions. Over to the diversion channel. It's here that the Auckland skin diver, Les Subritsky, has been giving outstanding assistance helping to repair the water gate. Up he comes with news for the engineer in charge of construction. Fifteen valuable roller bearings lie in the channel, torn from the 75-tonne water gate during an earlier test. Some at least can be recovered. Made of stainless steel and valued at £100 each, the bearings are a worthwhile catch. A useful follow-up to Sobritsky's earlier underwater work, without which the task of finishing the dam might have been greatly delayed. Now he's safely out of the water, the demolition charges in the tail race can be fired. On the upriver side of the dam, a boom now floats. Building it and getting it into position is just one of those jobs that have to be tackled by hydroelectric construction gangs. Its purpose is to prevent driftwood from floating down onto the intakes leading to the turbines. Note the level of the water now the boom is in position. From that mountain, Kahu, the extent to which the river has risen can clearly be gauged. The newly created lake, 14 miles long and covering 2,000 acres, will be one of the showpieces of the Waikato Valley. The hour for Operation Spillway approaches and few cars will cross the dam once these have passed. Today, the massive structure becomes a grandstand for hydro workers and their families. All is ready. The thunder of Fokamaru spillway will echo far beyond the valley, for it brings to the North Island the certainty of greater reserves of hydroelectric power.